Thank you very much. It's great to be here. I, a year ago in March, I went to Wichita and talked to their science cafe, and that was the last in-person presentation I did for that earlier. I've done one other in-person presentation this spring, so it's nice to be able Well, I'll just keep talking to you. Please, around please do. So, yeah. I'm sorry. I put a couple of things on each of your uh, places, I think. One of them is just a, a pocket guide to common Kansas backyard bird project. Bob Brett's and I did more years ago now than I'd like to think. But just a real handy little thing to keep, you know, at the window where you see your bird views. I get a lot of confidence of, and thanks on that one. The other one, we're seeing something with Lushi that nobody else has had the chance to see yet because I just updated it yesterday. It is the most current checklist of Kansas birds. This past fall and winter, we had a little visitor out of Scott Lake State Park called the Yellow White Junko. Looks pretty much like our standard Junkos, but they've got this evil looking yellow eye. They're normally down in the extreme southern Arizona. You go up on top of Mount Lemon, outside of Tucson to see them, or you go to Mexico to see them. And one showed up at Scotland State Park and saved the whole state in winter. I don't know how many people got to see that bird, but that was just crazy. So we are now up to 483 birds. Uh, three of those are either extinct or extirpated, probably four actually. But you know, it's it's I just updated it yesterday and realized I forgot to update the small print that said how many species there are in the state. So anyway, um, these will actually I'll I'll get we'll get that other mistake fix. This is available on the internet. At ksbirds, ksbirds.org. And I think I've got that website towards the end. So just a couple of references there. Um, if you have bird books and they don't look tattered and torn like this, you're not using them. Plain and simple. Um, nowadays, I, I use my phone to touch anything. I don't even have my favorite one, the Civic Guy here. But I'll talk a little bit about bird books later. But there's a lot of good bird books out there. There's a lot of good. The, are we ready to go, Jill? Okay. So, okay. Yeah. It's just that's really that is my go to most of the time. That's the app that I use most of the time. The most expensive app I have ever bought from my phone was $30. So, which is about what the book costs. And with the, with the app, you also have all the calls on it. So, um, yeah, I, I've been Gary County Extension agent for 30 years. Um, I've been there a while. All you really need to know about me. Oh, see, now it's not going to work. I mean, that isn't even going to work. So we'll just do this. Yeah. Oh, no, 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 no. Let's go back to here. Yeah. I don't map well. Um, that's my license plate. Actually, that's my old license plate. I didn't get a picture of my new one yet. But bird. There are bird watchers, and then there are birders. Avid bird watcher is an acceptable. Avid bird, plain and simple. So that's just the way it is. Um, I've been bird watching since I was four years old. My mother was a bird watcher. My grandmother was a bird watcher. I was genetically predisposed. I never had a chance. It was going to happen. It was just going to happen. But I, I literally would go. I grew up on a farm in Nebraska. I would go out with my mother um, when she'd be taking lunch out to my dad. And her binocular was as big as I was, and she had her. Roger Troy Peterson Guide to Western Birds. And I look at a sparrow or something, and then start going through and trying to, like everybody else, match the pictures. And if I had it right, my mother would tell me and read to me about it. If not, she'd say, That's not it. Keep looking. So it's, I, I've been doing it all my life. Um, birds have this natural fascination for just about everybody, even people that just say they don't care about birds. If a cardinal flies up in the middle of the winter, Bush, they're going to notice it. They're just happily, they're, they can be enjoyed multi sensually. You can see them, you can hear them. If you get around a vulture nest or underneath the heron rookery, you can smell them, and it's not necessarily pleasant. Um, the mere fact that they can fly, you know, think about a hummingbird and the way that they can fly. And we had a good reliable report of hummingbird at a feeder in Lawrence yesterday, by the way. Um, get your feeders up. Um, they're, they're just, they're nearly everywhere. They are nearly everywhere. I've got two phrases that basically say that say the same thing. One is ABB, always be birding. 
and the other side of that is envy envy never being not heard so it, it's just it's what i enjoy doing so and i will have to throw a few pictures of birds in here i don't take that many pictures of birds because i have all sorts of friends with cameras that cost more than my car does um did and and they just let me use their pictures so i you don't use that either. Yeah. Use the scissor tail flycatcher. They're they are found right after the eastern foods. Bird watching, bird feeding is big dollars, huge dollars. And I need to update this. Uh, U.S. Fish and Wildlife Survey has done several um, surveys over the years. They've done a more recent one, 2016 or 17. I need to get it in. But there's all these surveys being done. The, the Sandhill cranes in the Platte River of Nebraska. Um, last time, you know, and it depends on whether people call themselves just a backyard bird feeder or a bird watcher. Somewhere between 50 and 80 million Americans consider themselves bird watchers. In 2006, so that's 15 years ago now, they spent 40. You I have think such power out there. Yeah. You have such power. I guess so. <laughs> Okay, Kansas and bird watchers half jokingly, half serious say, shh, don't let anybody know. We've got an amazing, bird rich, amazingly rich bird life for not having a mountain range or having a coastal or having an ocean coast. Worldwide, over 10,000 species. Sometimes two species are lumped together by the taxonomist. Sometimes they get split into four different species. And sometimes they figure out, wait a minute, this bird is different than that bird. Are we been calling them the same? And the DNA work has just been amazing. North America, around 2,050 species. ABA area, which is the United States and Canada, now includes Hawaii and Greenland, I think. American, ABA is American Birding Association, to separate it from the American Bar Association. Uh, Kansas has 483 species. We have one more species that is pending. Uh, there's a Kansas Bird Records Committee of the Kansas Ornithological Society that reviews records of rare birds. And right now we're, we're pending on, an, on another one. So I'm, that's all I'm gonna say. I'm the secretary, but I can't say anymore. Can I, can I ask real quick? The, Absolutely. The, the three that are extinct, are they extinct here or everywhere? They are extinct everywhere. Carolina parakeet, <clears throat> passenger pigeon, More than likely, the Eskimo curve. Pastor Pigeon is far away. I've, I've seen the specimens taken from Kansas, the Carolina parakeet, and Passenger Pigeon down at KU. It's just, you look at that and you say, it can't be seen alive anywhere in the world anymore. It is, I mean, that's when extinct it really means something. One other has been extirpated. Extirpated is where it's no longer found in, in this state, but it's found elsewhere. The Gunnison sage grass. We have records from extreme western Kansas. From the 1800s so that's the, the one but it's it's still on there so um one of the most interesting i mean and we get bird records in some really unusual ways most of them come from bird watchers like me that are out birding and they whoa what is that oh man oh. and so we get excited and we get our friends there it was a, a summer night late summer two years ago three years ago and a friend that works for wildlife and parks had a friend that worked for a while, had a friend that worked for wildlife and parks who had a son that worked for a wind turbine company. And he was up in this wind turbine in Gray County, Kansas. And he looks out out of the access of the rotary. This is 300 and some feet up in the air. And here's this bird staring at him. And, and he knows enough to say, I don't think that's a normal bird that we see here in Kansas. Whips his cell phone out and snaps a couple pictures. He sends it to his dad. His dad sends it to Mike. Mike Rader sends it to me with the caption, Mike Rader's a real live bird, dear friend. And he says, take a look at this and tell me what you think. Now I get this stuff all the time. People think they got something rare and it's just a different version, a different age, sex, whatever, and what they see. I open the picture and I go, oh my God, that's a brown booby. And I'm like, fighting this 1030 knife, firing it back going, where on earth was this taken? And he tells me, so we're posted on Facebook and we're getting done. The next morning, there were 20 birders from across the state out at that wind farm. The bird was never seen again. 
It was never seen again. But because somebody popped their head out of an access port on a wind turbine um, nacelle and said, oh, that's a normal bird, and took a picture of it. Brown boobies are ocean going birds. We know that. And, and this particular year, there'd been one up at Harlan County Reservoir in south central Nebraska all summer long, actively feeding. I, I, I was going that way, so I had to make a try for it. I didn't get it. But it, it just, that's how crazy it is. And nowadays, everybody's got one of these. And guess what's on one of these? A camera. So we're getting a lot more pictures of rare birds. And the digital photography has just exploded our knowledge of birds. And we can see traditionally ornithologists would take a bird in hand and study it. That's why the red bellied woodpecker is called a red bellied woodpecker because about the only time you see a red belly, you have a bird in your hand and you blow it. So that's how we always used to do things. Well, having a bird in the hand, even a live bird in the hand, they look different. Their feathers aren't puffed up as much, they're holding themselves differently. With a digital photography, we can see images of how birds are holding their wings in flight and how they're holding individual feathers. And it is just exploding the, the database on what we know about birds. Okay, enough of that. Let's see a bright yellow bird that we'll actually see here in the next few weeks, Prothonotary warbler. And, and birds have personalities. That bird is very inquisitive about something. And you can just tell it by the way they're like, that. what's that? And it's just, it's, it's a yellow warbler. Um, a lot of debate on how it got its name. Nobody agrees on that. Um, but it's, it's one of those things that once you see one, that black eye on that bold lemon yellow face, and then that bluish gray on the wings, and a song that will blow you out of the water when they start singing if they're close by. So it's just a lot of fun. Okay, so why do we have so many birds in Kansas? Well, part of it is these are oh, flyways, and we always used to think that all birds followed all these flyways. Well, waterfowl follow those flyways pretty explicitly. What we call the passerine species, uh, the, the smaller perching birds, tend to just move in a wave across the state, across the country, state to state. So they don't follow the flyways nearly as much as we once thought they did. Waterfowl, yes. But even there, it, things are, are changing because we've got so many ways that we can track birds. We can use weather radar to track migration now. There's even websites that are doing that, and they will send out migration alerts going, if you live in eastern Kansas, tomorrow morning looks to be a good day to get out and go birding, like I need an excuse. Um, but more importantly, we're right in the middle of it all. We are right in the middle of it all. Growing up in the central United States, Nebraska, Kansas, people go, well, you're so far from everywhere. Yeah, but we're equally far from everywhere. I don't want to live anywhere else. We're far enough when we're between the north and the south. The owls will come in and other winter birds will come in. We'll get things moving in from Montana, crossbills, some of the, the big finches. We will get stuff coming up from the, from the desert southwest following the Cimarron River into Elkhart. How many of you have been to Elkhart, Kansas? It is on the Oklahoma border and three miles from Colorado. And it is a bird watching mecca. It is a bird watching mecca because so many birds come up from the West, right down the Cimarron River out of Colorado where they've blown up by storms. They've got more unique records for Kansas than any other county, simply because of location. And then we can get things like roseate spoonbills and wood storks and things like that that do post-breeding dispersal. Mom and dad have the kids raised, they're tired of the kids, they take off and head north. That's the simplest way to say post-breeding dispersal. So they came up from so we're, we're far enough east to get the eastern species. Right here in Riley, Geary counties, a lot of the warblers that come up through the eastern deciduous forest get the Kansas River and they follow that timbered corridor right on down to, to Junction City to Fort Riley and a little bit beyond. So right in this area, we have so much richness. You can get eastern deciduous forest warbler species breeding in areas on Fort Riley and, and be three miles away and have Henslow sparrows and upland sandpipes. You get this wonderful mix and diversity. It just makes it so incredibly awesome. It's exciting to bird here. I'm sorry, I get a little bit excited about my birds. Okay, I'm always big on having my theorems. Birds are tied to ecosystems. 
we are finally figuring it out. Well, hopefully the audiences are finally figuring it out. You don't try a species. You protect the ecosystem that that species need or ecosystems. And you'll go a lot further along. Ducks Unlimited, a hunting group, did a lot, has done and has continued to do a lot towards waterfowl management, especially at the breeding areas in the, in the prairie potholes in the Dakotas in Canada. And because of that, it has had a secondary impact onto a lot of non-game species. So if you learn what things need, if you want to find a warbling vireo, which is a really nondescript little bird about that big, you find some cottonwood trees. If you want to find a bell's vireo, another nondescript little bird about like that, but they both have really cool songs, you find a dogwood ticket. Birds are tied to certain things. Orioles love cottonwoods and American elms to build their nests in. They're going to build their nests out on the ends of the branches because they got these big branches that come down. And birds like to come and there are aerodynamics involved there that somebody could probably explain why. Um, birds can't adapt. People, we, we talk about things changing and some people say, well, we'll just have to adapt to it. No, they are hardwired. Birds are hardwired. If there are birds on the extreme edges of that hardwire range, what looks like adaption is simply natural selection. Natural selection to an unnatural occurrence. I don't go out bird watching because of what I know I'll see. I go out because of what I may see. That's the excitement, that's the thrill. My biggest miss of my life, my, we are living now in the house out on the farm near Milford where my wife grew up. And her mother, we had bird feeders and bird baths out. And her mother was always, her mother got us a lot of birds. She'd call up, well, I think I have such and such. And we go fly out after work and sure enough, she will. We're sitting in the airport in Atlanta, Georgia, January 2009. To Panama City, Panama, for two weeks of bird watching. It was a thank you gift to my wife. And so she calls her mother, who is, just before we lose, lose range, be out of touch. And her mother perfectly describes a bird that she's seeing on her bird bath in the middle of January. And it was likely a very thrush, which looks kind of like a robin, but kind of not. Didn't see it again. It wasn't until this past winter that, that another bird thrush showed up in Geary County at a friend's backyard, and I finally got up for Geary County. So it's when they, birds have wings and they use them. Dr. John Zimmerman did so much work out here, and that was one of his favorite phrases. People would say, would it be possible that I saw this here then? And they'd say, birds have wings and they use them. And that's why we chase birds sometimes, because they're not going to stay still. Here's another little rascal that just got back. That is a northern parula. It's one of the warblers. Gets up in the cottonwood trees. It really likes sycamore trees. And it tends to mess around sycamore trees. You think of warblers, a lot of people think of warblers, they think of trees. And yeah, they're in trees an awful lot. But the northern parula quite often will nest in tumbles around the base of trees, down low. A lot of them are ground nesting species. And that's why cats are so damaging to them. Yes? These last birds that you mentioned, and you mentioned like the elms, the cottonwoods, and the sycamores, is it that the birds like the trees or the birds like the riverine environment? Yes. They, they will usually, I mean, they're going to nest in those trees. Sometimes it is, it's, it's got to be the right tree the right ecosystem. Some are called Orioles will nest in town, out in the country. Wherever they can find an appropriate tree, they're they're adapt. They can they're not adapting. They have a broad enough food range, primarily caterpillars, that they can be anywhere where there are caterpillars. When you're watching birds, most of what you're going to see, ninety percent of the activity, comes down to basically two needs: food and sex. The the, the need to eat, the the urge to reproduce. Right now, we're on the latter one. Birds are coming through. Northbound migration is just a, a stampede because they the days are getting longer, the hormones get cranked up by the increasing hours of daylight, and they want to nest. And they just go pell-mell. When we get southbound migration then, starting in July, amazingly, 
Um, they tend to be a lot more, oh, I got time to get down south. It's all the time in the world. So that makes it a lot of fun with them. Got a great song. Kansas primarily has four big scale ecosystems. What I call the, just as we're going to talk about forests, grasslands, wetlands, slash aquatic, and those are actually two different things. And then disturbed, often cropland or urban. So let's get into those. Forests. Eastern deciduous forests, we've got these, these fingers of rivers coming out. And over the past 50 years, we've been monitoring the amount of, of riparian forests increasing. I think part of it, they were there originally and they got cleared out for firewood or building material in the 1800s. And now they're starting to come back. My dad growing up in Northwest Hurricane Nebraska, we used to talk about as, as a lad in the twenties, being out at night and would hear wolves along <clears> the, <throat> the very early stretches of the Blue River that dumps down here in the total. And he said by the thirties and forties, they were gone. I just think, oh man, it'd be so cool to be at our farm and hear wolves. That was just amazing. Um, and with development towns, and especially cemeteries, we usually have a lot of old trees. So that really comes into play. Uh, warblers, tanagers, vireos. Yeah, I was just talking about that. Here's an example of what we've been noticing. In 1989, Max Thompson, Chuck Healy, two professors, uh, published Birds of Kansas. Not to be confused with birds. Birds in Kansas, because the one that I don't do is Birds of Kansas. Yeah. Oh, we got one right here. Do you have the you have Thompson Healy's yeah. two volume set? Yeah. Oh, outstanding. First time that we really had a good censusing of all the species. Now, that was published in one in 1989, one in 1992. At that time, there were 435 species documented in the state. Since essentially since 1990, we've gone from 435 to 483, mainly because there's so many more people out bird watching and reporting those. That's the big difference. But those books have the very first, what we call county dot maps to show where the birds had been documented. So the barred owl, the, the riparian forest timber area equivalent of our great horned owl, which covers a lot more area, um, had been documented in these counties. And the solid black circles are simply site records. The open circles are confirmed breeding records. So that's where we were. And really, you got past about the, the old US 81 corridor there from Slida down to Wichita. You got west of there, you're pretty much out of their range. So that became our baseline. First time we really had a good documentation. 2001, I took a lot of sources and I created a set of what we call county checklists, individual checklists for all 105 counties. And I just tossed them out there on the internet, gave CDs to people, and those days it was CDs, it was on. Anyway, and said, there's a lot of stuff missing here, obviously. Let me know. So then I started getting records and people would, and I would start updating the checklists. So from fall of 2001 till today, I can go in and see every six months, basically, what's been added. I'm a real data nerd. I'm sorry, I can't help it, but I'm a real data nerd. So it, but it's given us a chance to document what's going on. Part of, part of what we're seeing is more birders out there, and part of it is very realistic range expansion. Mike Rader, heck of a good birder, lives right here. So if there had been barred owls anywhere around here, there for almost 10 years by then. Okay, so him, just kind of fun to go back and forth through those. You can see it just marching across there. And this was as of last fall. They're just continuing to move and usually following rivers. Usually following rivers. Got the Republican River going up here. We got the Arkansas River down here, some, or Arkansas River, take your choice. Um, but really moving across. We're seeing this with red-shouldered hawks. We're seeing with pileated woodpeckers or pileated woodpeckers. We're seeing the same thing. In 1989, there were four records of white-winged dove in Kansas. Now they're all across the state in almost 105 counties. And that's a case of where they just exploded. Global warming, probably. 
because they are a southern species. So anyway, so the timber areas are increasing. Grasslands. Do you call that invasive or just? No, it's it's more reaction. They're they're native to the United States. The Eurasian collar dove, yeah, that's an invasive species. It's an invading species. It, it depends on if they displace other species. But with global warming, as some species move up from the south, others are moving on further north as well. Black cap chickadee has a compatriot species, the Carolina chickadee. Right now, the Carolina chickadee is pretty well restricted to this area right here. 50 years ago, it was just barely into the state. Carolina chickadees are at their northern limit here. They can't handle the, the colder weather, they, but they can handle the hot weather. Black cap chickadees can't handle the hot weather. And what we're seeing, especially in points further east, is this line keeps moving north and north and north. Pennsylvania around oh, Valley Forge, for example, I've got a friend there. They tell me that 40 years ago, it was all black cap chickadees. Now they can't find a black cap chickadee, it's all Carolina chickadees. So a lot of it is just displacement. One's going, one is going out to, because of the heat, the other one's coming in because of the heat. Well, I thought there might be a lot of different uh, stress on, on the food supply, if different animals, different birds, one the same food as the bird that's already there. The, the, what we're seeing right now about food supplies is because of the ins a lot of these are insect eaters, especially the, the migrants, they're insect eaters. So they're coming up from Central America, from South America. Their movement is triggered by increasing day leaf. A lot of their food sources are here all the time. Because of slowly warming weathers, slowly warming weathers, that is the thing. And because of the, the rising temperature, they are getting started earlier. So before the migrants would show up trying to time their arrival with a rising peak of food for their young, well, now they're missing the peak. A lot of the shorebirds that go up to the, to the tundra, to the Arctic Circle, they arrive just as all the black flies come out. Black flies are coming out earlier. So, I mean, there's all sorts of interaction. And we're just still trying to figure them, figure them all out. In 50 years, we'll be able to tell you better when it's too late, more than likely. Okay, grasslands. And, and Kansas is a prairie state. Great Plains are prairie states. Going from the tall grass prairie in the east to the short grass prairie in the west with everything in between. Um, a lot of species, flycatcher, scissor tail flycatcher is strongly associated with the tall grass prairie and the mid grass prairie. Prairie chickens, both prairie and wetland sandpipers, a lot of very specific attractions. You get past Salina and Henslow sparrows just flat disappear. They just disappear. And then they slowly start to get replaced by casting sparrows. Same, similarly related birds, same kind of habitat. So there are these species that are attracted and tied to the different ecosystems. <laughs> Wetlands and aquatic. Aquatic is Milford Lake. It's totally Creek Reservoir. It's a large open body of water. Wetlands are going to be marshes that have emerged vegetation, whether they're cattails or smartweed or just about anything. That's going to be the areas on the upper ends of all these lakes where the really good duck hunting and birding goes. They're known for, um, for the petal ducks, the mallard, the teal, rails, shorebirds, terns, and eaglets. Aquatic, you know, that open area, deeper water, that's where you're going to have diving species, loons, corrons, some of the other <coughs> some of the diving ducks, canvasback and redhead, for example, scop. So those are, I mean, we kind of love them together and yet they're very distinctly different. There is some overlap. Anytime you have two ecosystems that meet, grassland and deciduous forest, that edge effect just is so rich with diversity. So rich with diversity. And for a state that is semi-arid, we have a lot of, of wetlands and aquatic habitats. Corps of Engineer Ayers bought up a lot of farmland, granted, but boy, they create a lot of great habitat. We've got all the, the, the Corps of Engineers lakes, we've got local marshes, 
the Playa Lakes region of Western Kansas. And if you think of the Playa Lakes start down in Texas, they come up through Oklahoma and Kansas. You get in Nebraska, you have the Rainwater Basin area, and then the Sand Hills, and then you're up into the Prairie Pothole region. region. Same basic type of topography. These, these natural basins, ephemeral wetlands. If it's a wet season, if it's spring, there's going to be water there, otherwise it's going to dry up. That same basic thing. Um, Cheyenne Bottoms and Bavir National Wildlife Refuge are two absolute gems. There are species of shorebirds like the, the white rope sandpiper. 90% of the world's white rope sandpiper population fuels up Cheyenne Bottoms or Quivira. It's just amazing. Sandhill cranes go through this very similar narrowing effect, but there's just a lot of areas that have a lot of, you know, people, bird watchers all across the country, they know about Cheyenne Bottoms. They know about Quivira. They may know nothing else about Kansas, but they know those two large marshes. And they're quite different. Cheyenne Bottoms is freshwater. Clavira is actually a saltwater marsh. And it's absolutely, they, they smell differently when you pull into them in the middle of summer. It smell, yeah, they got a very unique, wetlands have a unique smell. I grew up on the North Standard Acre Rainwater Basin. I used to tromp around through those things so much, both bird watching and hunting as a kid. Wetlands are so amazing. Okay, disturbed habitats. Uh, cropland is one, um, and, and some of them are very devoid of birds. Others are amazingly active with birds. Wheat fields tend to have more birds in them than say a cornfield or a soybean field. I tell people that if you see a lot of birds out in a wheat field, there's probably an insect problem because they're gonna follow the food. They're gonna follow the food. I, we were doing this uh, KOS, Kansas Ornithological Society spring meeting down in Southeast Kansas. And we were in, uh, I don't know, Allen County, Woods, I can't remember what, what it was, but we were caravanning along and I saw a lot of bobblewinks in a wheat field. Bobblings are cool birds. Yeah. Look like a bumblebee almost. But they're an insect eater. They're going to be after alfalfa weevil larva. They're going to be after any kind of caterpillar. And this wheat field was just full of bobblings. I made a note of where it was. The following Monday morning, I called the county agent down there. A friend of mine said, hey, Christy, get out to this location. Check out the wheat field on the southwest corner of this intersection. I said, there may be an insect problem there. It was loaded with army cutworms. And they were able to spray it and, and save any more further damage. It's just absolutely amazing. So um, towns, cemeteries, water treatment facilities, and feedlot runoff ponds are all oases for birds in Western Kansas. Yeah, a water treatment pond, the sewer ponds, because it's the only open water. The number of new records for counties in western Kansas that come from water treatment ponds, even warblers migrating through. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, towns quite often, you go to Greeley County, Kansas, the only trees you're going to find are at the cemeteries or in town. That's it. So when a bird is flying along at 5,000 feet or higher in migration, the sun's starting to come up, it's time for them to land, because most small birds migrate at night, they're going to start looking for trees. And they just, they are absolute oases. Before we started doing the, the county list, the county listing, the, uh, the county checklists, and we started Greeley County had 117 species on the list. That's ridiculous. Nobody had birded there. All of a sudden we've got people going all sorts of places where they've never gone before because of the competitive nature of birding. They want to have one more bird in that county than the next person. Um, you've seen a lot of these vegetation maps. It just kind of shows how incredibly diverse Kansas is. And the greens are, are grasslands, so there's a lot of grasslands, but you got the cross timbers, you got Oak Hickory Forest. This is a little bit of the Ozark Plateau that comes into Kansas. <laughs> and there's these interesting little, have you ever been driving along, I said you just passed Abilene, I mean, just, just past that next exit, and there's just all of a sudden there's just these like sand hills of Kansas kind of thing. Just a little blip of the Sand Sage Prairie, which is heavy down and through there. There's actually a special water um, uh, what are, uh, aquifer protection zone there because it is very, very sandy. And it's just this wonderful diversity across Kansas. Then, of course, the blue lines, consider those the highways. That's how a lot of the birds are going to travel. 
Remember I said birds have personalities and they're either driven, they're driven 90% of the time by food or sex. That's a male blue grosbeak. That's a female blue grosbeak. There's a fellow that I, he sent me a lot of pictures in the early 2000s. I haven't talked about him for years. I don't know if he's even still alive, but he saw these blue grosbeaks. The male is showing off his superiority to be a, a father to her offspring. And she is in a submissive position, saying that she accepts him as a mate. The next picture I won't show, but um, you can figure out what happened next. We have little blue gross foods. Um, it's just, I was watching crows. I had, I had a, a railing outside my office window, and I had a nail stuck in there, and I put ears of corn on it, just see if anything would come around. Well, eventually we had a squirrel show up, but I quit taking it. But anyway, I looked out there one day, and here was an ear of corn, and here were three crows in a line. And the one crow was out there, had a foot up a pound of base head, and was picking off kernels. And did this for two or three minutes, and finally the crow second in the line, I swear, looked back at the number three crow, and number two crow walked up, stepped on the first crow's foot. The first crow looked at it and then flew away, and then they moved up in line. <laughs> Just the, the personalities that birds have. It's just absolutely amazing. Um, use every resource available to you. If you have a checklist for a specific county and there's a bird that isn't on that checklist, okay, why isn't it on that checklist? But more importantly, the bird books. Your ears. Listen, now, I, I happen to have a wife who is a bird watcher and has phenomenal hearing, and I'm like most men that are in their mid-60s, I'm starting to lose some of my hair. Too many guns, too many rock and roll concerts, I guess. But um, it's helpful to have other people around. My birding mentor, other than my mother, was a farmer in the area. And Jay and I were birding with him and the old guy that used to run the local weekly newspaper, who was also a bird watcher. One Sunday morning, we were back visiting, and a bird had hopped up on a fence post. And it, 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 it was a grasshopper sparrow. It's a grasshopper sparrow. And Norris looked at Lee and said, oh, to have young ears again. I mean, it's just, there's so many clues there. Spend as much time watching and observing the bird as possible. You see something you don't know. This isn't gonna go anywhere. It's in your hip pocket, it's in the car, whatever. It'll still be there when the bird is gone. Too many times I see people, people look at a bird for three seconds and immediately start doing this. Spend time looking at the bird. Look at all the birds. Um, take notes. Yeah, I already talked about that. Observing not just what the bird looks like, but what it's doing, how it's acting. I thought about putting a, a, a picture in with this, but it was just too freaky, so I didn't. Um, the one thing that was not on that previous one, Home. If you talk to a new bird watcher, a non-bird watcher, and they try to describe you a bird, what are they going to start with? Yeah. Going to start with what the color was. And that is, that is because in the close up picture of your senses. They are selfish, they are egotistical. Sometimes we'll be out walking, that's my wife Jay in the back there. Um, she's been out scouting for us. Uh, we'll be out someplace in the spring, you know, a little bit after sunrise, and we'll pull you know, camping chairs out of the car and just plop them down the road and sit down and we'll listen. Close our eyes and listen. The minute you close your eyes, your eyes can't distract you. Your eyes cannot distract you. And you can hear so much more. Eyes can see millions of colors and hues and shades and tints. And then we wind up trying to match that particular tint up with the bird, in the bird book. And that's where we get into problems. That's where we get into problems. Um, do I have that slide in here? Yeah, okay. People don't like sparrows. They're not colorful and all that. Sparrows are birds of the prairie. They are subtle. You have to look for the fine nuances. You go to the mountains, go to the ocean, and it slaps you in the face. 
Look at me on the mountains, on the ocean. You've got to get out in the prairie to understand the subtleties of it. Sparrows are the same way. That happens to be a Henslow, uh, Lacan sparrow. Jill's like, that's not a Henslow. <laughs> that's a Lacan sparrow. It, it nests up in the, in the prairies of North Dakota. South Dakota, and they come and they go. They're on their way further south. They get down to about Oklahoma, and that's all further south they normally go. In mild winters, they will be here. But look at that buffy orange in the face. It doesn't slap you like the orange on the breast of the blackbird and warbler, but it's subtle. It's one of my favorite sparrows. That and the Lincoln sparrow are some of my favorites, and they're just very, very subtle and enjoyable. The front of every bird book is the most underutilized bits of paper in the world because they tell you so many things. Sibley, the, I mean, they all have lots of good stuff. The topography of a bird and different groups of birds we use different words because of what we see on them on a regular basis. Now this is a songbird. That would be a large sparrow, another prairie species, yes. Notice how I get those in there. Um, and it points out a lot things. Now we're not going to spend all our time going, okay, what's the belly? What's this? It, it starts to become automatic. You start to see what jumps out at you. you know, does it have a, does it have a wing bar or different colored coats, mean coats, you know, throat, head, whatever. You start looking at things. Even the, the what's the color of the wings can make a big difference. Things like birds of prey will have different things that you need to look at. One that we talk about, and it's not on this one amazingly, are the tagials right in through here, this area. Because in red-tailed hawks, it will almost always have this dark leading edge of the wing up close to the body. None of the other species really have that that we're going to get here. So just spend some time learning the topography of the bird. Attention to detail, shape, location, habits, bill type and color. The bird's bill. will tell you what they eat. Vireos and warblers, tiny little narrow bills, because they're eating insects. Compare that to a cardinal, to a house finch that has a stouter, stiffer beak to break open seeds. A great blue heron has this long dagger that's going to slam into the water to get a fish. You know, very effective. Uh, wing yet. Don't get hung up on matching. Everybody sees colors differently. My wife and I will argue for a minute whether a certain paint color, for an hour, whether a certain paint color is more blue or more gray. And it comes down to time of day and what the light is. We were just, we we're selling our place in town because we moved a year ago. And we use the same color through the kitchen, the dining room, the living room. And as you go through that house and look at that, here it looks more blue, here it looks more gray. Early and early light and late light. Photographers love the sweet light, but it will also distort how you view the bird, especially the white parts of the bird. You can give it an orangish hue, you can give it a purplish gray, it, it can just change it. Great for photography, you can really mess up ID. So, you know, how far, yeah, and, and sometimes, especially people send me pictures of birds. And if you think about it, I mean, the digital photography is amazing. But you are taking a three-dimensional, living, breathing, moving creature, and you're sending me a two-dimensional, one two thousandth of a second slice of its life. And, and they they're never got all the parts that you need to, to identify. Sometimes convert it to black and white, and it'll actually make it easier to identify the bird. People get hung up on house finches and purple finches. Well, is it more cherry red or is it more kind of a plum bird? Don't worry about that. Look at other things. There's that are more easily going to tell you the difference. Here are three warbler species. They are all yellow warblers, lowercase. But they're all very, very different. Here's the planetary warbler we saw earlier. That actually is a yellow warbler. And the males are going to have these streaks going through their breasts. And on the far left hand side, there is a blue winged warbler. They're all yellow, slightly different shades of yellow if you want to get on that, but that's not what we're going to look at. 
We're going to look at this. We're going to look at the, the black eye on the solid yellow face. We're going to look at this, this dark area in through the wing, the tail, the back. Compared to the yellow warbler that has the same dark eye and yellow face, but then we've got on the males, we've got the streaking through here. In the fall, when female yellow warblers or immature yellow warblers are coming through, it's sort of like, okay, it's a yellow warbler that doesn't have a whole lot of detail on it. It's a yellow warbler. Dark line through the eye can really help. So we're, we try to pick out other things than just the color. Yes, yeah, sometimes so. Now, what's going to happen? Is, was anybody, did anybody uh, participate in the Wings and Wetlands virtual um, burning festival here a couple weeks ago? Had a fellow out of California, an acquaintance of mine, Alvaro Jaramillo, awesome burger. And he was, went through how the brain does fast processing, slow processing, just amazing how as you get further into it, it doesn't matter whether it's insects, whether it's birds, whether it's plants, whether it's wildflowers, you get to the point of where there's just certain things that grab your attention so fast that you make this identification in a split second. I tell people, as you drive down the country road, you can identify a lot of birds where all you can see is how they fly and their silhouette when they're sliding up. You know, if the thistle flies up and lands on a power line, flying down from, a, from the wire to, a, to the field is going to fly differently than a half square would. So you get into this just instant identification. And how does it happen? How do you identify a, a good friend or family member two blocks away walking down the street? You just immediately know that it's them. You don't go through, well, they have blondish hair on there. No, you just, you know, because of how they walk and other things. So, so Jeff, the, these birds don't interbreed at all? Nope. Nope. There is, I mean, there are closely related species. Blue-winged warbler has a compatriot species, the golden-winged warbler, and they will hybridize. And then you get what they call the Brewsters, or it depends on whether it's which one's a male, which one's a female, as of the different combinations they get. That's a well-known one. But these three in particular, nope, absolutely no hydration. Absolutely none. Baltimore Oriole and Bullock's Oriole were at one point in time collapsed into one species called Northern Oriole, and they figure, oh, now wait a minute. No, there's actually some differences here. So it's you know, red shaft of flicker, yellow shaft of flicker. Used to be northern, there used to be one out of northern flicker. So I mean it's there's not as much hybridizing that goes on within a crossbird species as we as we think, except in gulls. Gulls are a mess. Gulls are just an absolute mess. Driving geneticists crazy on that one. So what distinguishes this bird from a similar species? I always encourage people to study the common birds well, because a lot of things that people send me pictures of to identify are the uncommon presentation of the common species. It's a female cowbird, or it's a female red-winged blackbird. We're used to seeing the males. Not brilliant glory, sort of. Um, but we don't think adult males, adult females, with the exception of high, larger birds that might have multiple year Molds, but you're gonna have males, you're gonna have females. In the fall, in August, September, we're gonna have males, females, immatures. Okay, now I just got more confusing. What characteristics does it have with other species in the same order of family? What habits does it have? Intently watch the bird. John Zimmerman used to talk about there's bird watching. And then there's watching, you just dismiss all the other robins. Bird watching is going, now what's that robin do? Does it walk or does it hop? How does it locate the, is it like seeing it? Is it hearing the worm or just how is it finding it? So there's lots of little differences that we can have. And, and it's, and there's a lot of people that are British, the Brits would call them tickers, a tick mark on the checklist. But a lot of us really enjoy watching the bird. How does it behave? Watch a, a blue gray neck hitcher build a nest. Absolutely amazing to just observe birds running their daily lives. Form, silhouette. How does it fly? Woodpeckers go flap, 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 glide, flap, 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 glide, and just go right on. Very distinctive ways they fly. 
you know, crows. Is it a crow way over there or is that a hawk? Well, it never stopped flapping, so it's a crow. The day that the corvids, the, the crows and the ravens, had soaring lessons, the crows skipped out. Crows just don't soar. They may glide for short distances, but they don't soar. If it's not flapping at all, it's not a crow. How does it, does it walk or does it hop? And that's a big difference. And have you ever walked? Is it walking? Is it hopping? Grackles tend to walk. <laughs> so it's very, you know, how does it hold or move its tail? House rents always have that tail up. Blue green adventures always have the tail up, just cocked up. I don't know why. General impression of shape and size was something that uh, the, the military was teaching soldiers for World War II when aircraft became more important. You know, get that general look at the different, you know, is that one of ours, is that one of theirs? The general impression of shape and size. The problem with that is when you've got a bird by itself, what are you going to compare it to for size? Well, I think it was about four and a half inches long. Why? Well, it looked about that long. Really? How far away was it? I don't know. So unless there's other things now, if it's with other birds, you can say, well, it was larger than the goldfinch, but smaller than the grackles. Your relative, they'll get reports from the Bird Records Committee, and people will say the bird was about six and a half inches long. You don't know that. You looked that up in the book. I'm a cynic. I can't help it. Um, some of the older bird books that I've read had these illustrations in them, and they're just absolutely wonderful. Kites and golf. I mean, I don't even begin to tell you how many things I've turned metal arcs into. I turned a metal arc into a prairie falcon one day. And it's just absolutely amazing what the mind can do. Pigeons in flight can look a lot like a gull. I messed up those two up before, too. This is out of the old Chandler Robbins Golden Guide, which I'm not, you know, it was kind of record setting for its era, like Roger Tory Peterson was. I never cared for it as much as others. Um, but, but they've got some of those in there too. The old Roger Tory Peterson hardbound green cover. Put them up in the back inside, the, uh, the front inside, had illustrations of just silhouettes of birds. My mom used to grill me on those. Oh, man. It's hard. Um, you know, is it more like this? Is it more like this? And there's, I mean, all birds will do all things, but in general, we're looking at generalizations here. Upright, does it do lots of flapping? Does it, is it a turkey vulture that can go for hours without soaring? And that's the same for all across the world. I spent a month in Africa, well, it was April of 2020, uh, 2002. Um, so that was 19 years ago now. And you could set your clock or your watch by when the vultures started getting up in the air. Because the wind never changed. And at 930, there were enough thermals that the vultures would launch off all the, all the buildings and start circling. Birds are creatures of habit too. So they're pretty well gone now. That's our last migrant to arrive in the fall for this passerine species, the American tree sparrow. And about the first one that's gone. They're, they're usually gone by now. I haven't seen one for a couple of weeks. One thing about a tree sparrow, and this is one, the upper mandible and the lower mandible are different colors. The upper mandible is dark, the lower mandible is light. One of those great ways to see it. A field sparrow that can be here at the same time has a pink beak. So just little things you can look at. They have nothing to do with the feathers. Practice, keep a list, put up a bird feeder. Um, take a walk and listen. I mean, I. I said, I've been a county agent for over 30 years, and all the farmers know that I'm a bird watcher. I'll be out talking with them. All of a sudden, it's like, I know I've heard something. <laughs> the uncommon presentation of the common species. Those darn metal arcs are always out to get me. Uh, some of the books that I recommend, Jansen Grass Guide to Kansas Birds, uh, that was printed about 20 years ago. It is being updated right now. They hope to have it out by the end of 2022. It also has um, some good burning hotspots in it. 
Kaufman, Birds of North America, Sibley, Guide to the Birds, National Geographic, Peterson Field Guide Series. I mean, those are all books that I have. I don't have the Crosley Guide on there. Some people like the Crosley Guide. I'm not so big on that uh, for various reasons. Um, so just any of those are good. If you're really, truly a beginner, I think Kaufman does a really good job. Ken Kaufman was born in Ohio, but grew up in Wichita. Dropped out of school with his parents from Michigan and spent the next three years hitchhiking across America. And he does an amazing job of being able to still think like a beginning bird watcher. The, the orientation of birds in the book are not my family like most places, like most of you, all these sparrows are going to. He puts them together. I mean, no other bird book where you find sandhill crane on the same page with great blue hair. So, I mean, he does a good job of thinking like a beginner still. And just a very nice guy. Just a very humble individual. Well, and Sid would let you just go down to this side and just kind of hear and watch them. Oh, yeah. I mean, there's they each have their strengths and just find one. Some people want to have pictures. Some people want to have illustrations. And one of the reasons why I like to people to have bird books is because if you're trying to look up a bird on the internet that's back, forward, back, forward, and that's like that, it's a bird book. You can pick it up and have three or four species on the same page. You can sit down in the evening, and I have so many times as a kid, and just start going through page by page by page and look at the pictures. You know, most of us are pretty visual learners. And that's why I like to have the book. Just because it's got, you can see, you can see four different J species on one page. These are spread J's and stellar J's and blue J's. Birds of Kansas, um, boy, that was a labor of love. That thing sucked up four years of my life. I don't regret a bit of it. I don't regret a bit of it. Just absolutely amazing. At the time that it was published in May of 2011, 10 years ago now, that was the biggest book University Press of Kansas had ever published. It was five and a half pounds. <laughs> yeah, it's not a book to take out in the field, but it's got dates of occurrence. Just a lot of information. The first map that there were range maps. Like you'd see in other field guys to know not only that it's you know it was in yellow so that means it's going to be here in the summertime it's in green so it's going to be migratory with two counties in yellow so it's known to breed in those two counties as the first time there was a field guy specifically for kansas that had range maps in it like that now if you had to set up in that room, it'll fall down but um and i got to have a i made all the maps I made all the maps. I'd read the descriptions of the species. I also had some of the forward. And then I'd sit down and, and start to make it and get all the resources from, from the maps that I already had going that were on the internet. Um, but it was, oh man. To help with the audio, and that's where these things have just helped so Because you can look at yesterday. Oh no, it's reset now. But you can no, I don't want a gray light use. You can pull up a red breasted nut hatch and press this press the song. And you've got it right there. Yeah. That's siblings. You can shut up now. They do get rather annoying after a while. But the Sibley app, um, Nat, National Geographic did have one. I don't think they've updated it. It was on an old version. Um, iBird, and iBird Pro is another one. A very good website is the Cornell All About Birds website. There, there were older, you know, CD, Social Guide, Peterson Field Guys. CDs, but they become an announcement you put on. An album, a cassette, or a CD. They would probably use just the most common calls. With the apps, they've got not only the calls, they've got the skull notes, they've got all sorts, they've got a lot more sound there. That's what I really like about it. Merlin? Merlin is, a, is another app that's from Cornell. And it will try to lead you to something, and sometimes it'll lead you right down the wrong path. 
as you try to identify something. But it's official. <laughs> something this is more about that I need to take Nat Geo out of there, Audubon Birds, yeah. I mean that that page really needs to be updated. Um, but they're all very reasonably priced. This was a warbler guy who came really into warblers. We got 40 warbler species in Kansas that have been documented in Kansas, and probably 30 plus of those on a on any given spring. And, the, and their calls can be so critical, so critical. KSBirds.org is one that is sort of the Lyco Society. It's where I got the county checklist project. Um, this is a, a, a rogue extension office site um, <laughs> that has, I've got an eight, yeah, an eight bulletin series on backyard birding guides. Sibley Guides, birds.cornell.edu is the all about bird site. We'll get you there. That may have changed over the night. I better check that one. Okay, we're going to wind up, yes, with optics. Binoculars. You don't have to have binoculars, but eventually you will wish that you did. If you get into it, and it's not just for, for birds, for seeing mammals, um, even seeing butterflies. It's amazing because a lot of these binoculars are going to have fairly close focus capability. You think, it's 10 feet away, why do I need to focus on it? Trust me, there will be times that you wish you could. Um, people will talk about, oh, I just I love the knock. Lens here, lens here. And if you just had that, like a lot of telescopes do, things will be flipped upside down, and backwards. So within these binoculars, there are two prisms that bounce it around and correct it. When you have cheap binoculars and they get dropped, these prisms get knocked out of alignment. And that's why you pick it up and you take it down and you're seeing two of everything. And, and that's one of the signs of, of cheap binoculars. Seven to 10 power, 35 to 50 objective lens. Objective is the, is the big end. You can get compact binoculars that are smaller, like 25. They have less power and smaller field of view. Trying to find a bird in the tree. 35 to 50, um, 42, 43 millimeter seems to be the sweet zone for a lot of people. <clears throat> higher than 10 power, you can get 20 power binoculars. You can't hold them still. You cannot hold them still. Avoid zoom binoculars. Sounds good. Nope. Leave the zooming to the telephoto lenses on cameras. Avoid fixed focus binoculars. <clears throat> fixed focus binoculars, everything, you can either get them for close focus or far focus. And it's like looking at a TV screen. Everything's the same. You have no depth of field. It's just, oh, drive me nuts. 7 by 35, 8 by 42, 10 by 42 are really common. Um, if most of your burning you think is going to be in your backyard, in the woods, where you're not going to be looking that far away, 8 by 42 is an excellent, excellent choice to go with. Ten by four two. If you look at Tuttle Lake, and you're the closest you can get to that bird is a half mile away. You want as much magnification as you can get, or go to a spotting scope. If they are sealed in a stiff plastic container, you don't want to buy them. If they have a built-in di digital camera, the digital cameras, I, and I don't know if there's any of those still available, but the digital camera is crap, the binoculars are crap. Again, good idea, lacking on the character. Uh, compact <coughs> binoculars, we already talked about that. What's a stiff binocular? If they're sealed in the stiff plastic, so you think about when you go and you buy nuts at the hardware store and you're getting three three pieces of hardware and it's in the stiff plastic. Oh, if, they're sold that way. if they're sold that way, don't get them. You don't want them. Put those down before I drop them. I've had these for 20 years now. I had them about a year. And I had them, was worrying about them. About my Pardon me or crack my ribs. And one of the retainer rings right in there has a little divot in it. Did not knock them out of focus. So that's, I mean, I know people will take binoculars like that and drop them on the floor just to show that they'll take it. And it's like, no, nah, I'm not going to do that. I have too much respect for <laughs> um, You know, I, and I, 
from about 150 up, you can start getting good binoculars. But there are quite a few companies that have lower end stuff. Nikon, Bushnell, Pentax, Swift, Vortex are all good binocular brands. They have cheap binoculars, but the higher up you go, the better. These are some, I did this to show you the range of what's available. The Vortex Diamondbacks are outstanding. I believe they're made in the United States. Um, Pentax, my wife and I got matching these in 2001. They were about $400, $450 a piece. The equivalent binocular today is down around 250 to 300. That's how much the improvements in the optics, the prisms, and the chassis have come along. It's a lot better. It's a lot better. Nikon Monarch five or sevens. I'm probably going to be giving myself a new pair of binoculars just because it's been 20 years. I want the high density lenses. Um, and Monarch fives are, are a good shot, but Bushnell and Gage. And if you want to go top of the line, you can get yourself a pair of Swarovskis and spend 3000 I have looked through Swarovskis. And yeah, they're pretty, as binoculars say, that's a sweet piece of glass. Um, they're good. Are they 10 times better than these? No. No. It's got high end. I mean, I've got a, actually got a guy out in the car that has all the upper end. But you get into this 250 to $500 range, you are going to get very good binoculars that, 20, that you can use nearly every day, and 20 years later, you'll still be using them. You'll still be using them. When I get my new binoculars, I will send these, and, and my wife's old pair, because I had her pair of Nikon 5, Monarch 5s here a couple years ago for Christmas. Um, I'll send them back to the company and get them clean and realigned. There are image stabilization um, binoculars that are increasingly popular. I don't know, are those Canons? These are uh, Fuji. Fuji, okay. Um, got a friend that has uh, Parkinson's and standard binoculars do not work for them, but he got a pair of image stabilization, stabilizing and he can look at birds a lot better than he used to. So. Now, the other thing, and we'll go through this section. One size, one side, one ring, one of the eyes, excuse me, has what's called a diopter adjustment. When, our, when we have, our eyes don't see things the exact same way. So we have to go through some adjustments on that. If you wear glasses, binoculars are set up so that the objective lens, or the whatever one, the end you look through, the lens is set to be a certain distance away from your eye. And a lot of them have adjustments that you can make on them. Might just pull straight up or go down. If you don't wear glasses, you want those out. If you wear glasses, you want them in. It's that simple. So that your eye is the correct distance away from this lens. So when we get ready to head out here in a few minutes, we'll, we'll go through an exercise to try to get, get them personalized for you. I'll, and like I said, a lot of times people just don't have those things set up. Um, Mike Rader, I mentioned him before, he talked about about three years ago, we had the same realization that people don't know how to adjust their binoculars. And so we always start, if it's, we have people we don't know in the group or haven't used binoculars very much, we always start with, this is your binocular. This is how you use it. So it's helpful. Yeah, yeah. So anything about 10X for me, I, I shape two. Oh, yeah, yeah. I'm, I've got 10x42s here. My new ones will probably be 10x42s. Um, 8x42s are 7 to 10 power. The old days was 7x35s. Seven or eight power is, is really good for, uh, for closer birding for woodlands. Um, you can find a lot of good places. Don't go to Walmart. A lot of sporting goods stores, Academy, Dick Sporting Goods, Cabela's, or Bass Pro carry a lot of binoculars because a lot of hunters want them for, um, for either on the range or for just for that hunt for big game so they can see. Opticsforbirding.com. Uh, line work there they says they have excellent selection outstanding selection you can find them a lot of place adorama out of new york city has a lot of binoculars bmh photo has a lot of binoculars these folks are it's they're focused on bird watchers and wolves wolves yes wolves thank you use them 
Yeah. yeah. And, and that's the thing, if you can get someplace where you can try them. It's kind of like a pair of shoes. You really need to try a pair on. You really need to try a pair on. So those wolves, like, yeah, I was going to put wolves up there, but yeah. Great place to get camera supplies too. So, and we'll wind up with a little Kentucky Warbler. They'll be coming back around the, the probably first of May. They're a ground nesting species. You'll, we'll have them along the, in the riparian timber here. And look at the feet on that guy, pinkish. The other thing that digital is allowed us to do much better before details. A lot of the passerine species, the perching birds, have incredibly long toenails. And birds apparently call them talons. Just incredibly long. So birds are not going to go, for the most part, birds will not migrate further south than they absolutely have to because flight is energy intensive and it's dangerous. It puts them at risk. So if they can make it only to Sedgwick County before they have to head back north, they're going to be in better shape than the birds up and all over Dallas, the same species. You know, how many eagles we have here in the wintertime depends on how much open water we have, how much open water Nebraska has. Here. Turkey vultures, what do they eat? Rotting flesh. They've got to have decomposing bodies. So they will go only as far south as they have to to find roaches. That is a frozen. Black vultures have stronger neck muscles. They can actually rip fresher meat apart. They will, they will stay further north even than turkey vultures. And black vultures are slowly moving into Kansas. Breeding in, well, probably breeding in quite a few southern counties, but we know for sure four or five. So yeah, it's just there's so many wonderful adaptations. So we get really I mean, I'm a little carried away, I'm sorry. Um, but it's it just fascinating. And I tell people it doesn't matter, you know. You can just put out bird feeders in your backyard, joy and pleasure. You can call it a wild canary. I don't care. But the technically correct name is, is American goldfinch. It's like spines. I, I like they, they changed the genus name for the goldfinch of the system. So now the pine system's scientific name is spinous pines. <laughs> it's kind of fun. So anyway, we'll go out and, and spend some time. I need to pretty good today. I've, I've got an old bird watching injury here, so I occasionally wear it. Wear a brace and keep you from doing. Remember not to do something stupid. Um, Brad, but not while you talk about that. Well, first of all.